before we get started. Let's get set up to be started. Well, there we go. All right, the couple of announcements are, and this is just restating what we've already said. Um, there's the Jorian. All right. Um, in case some of you weren't here to hear it last time, Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, I have a doctor's appointment. 10 o'clock, have to be there for labs, so guess what? That wipes out the entire class because uh, the I need to be there at labs at 9, so the class would normally start at 9.30. I'll be at Kirkland Clinic, and then uh, the appointment's at 10, um, and it goes till 10. The uh, earliest I can get out of it is 10.15, uh, and by the time I drive back here, it'll be close to 11 o'clock. So it wipes out our whole class. So what y'all decided last time was let's make up the class not tomorrow, but next Friday. Okay? Same time, same room. So 9.30 uh, next Friday. Now, if you can't be here, I'll record it. It'll all be out there on YouTube. Okay? But uh, for all who can, try to be here next Friday. I'll remind you, next Tuesday and next Thursday, we will have class on that Friday. I would have had it tomorrow, but I've heard there's supposed to be a meeting tomorrow, so I don't know what time the meeting is, so uh, and it's going to be on the Birmingham campus, so I've got to be there. So, um, so that's one. The second <clears throat> is pretty important, too. I know I said it, and I can't recall if I had any takers at the time, but about the math team, I did tell you all that, right? Okay. Were any of you interested in doing that? Okay. Yes? Maybe? Okay. Um, it, I, I thought of another carrot to hang out there. Okay. Are any of you pre-engineers? Yes, some of you are. Okay. In your future, and it's a good ways into the future, you'll probably be taking the PE exam, the Professional Engineering exam. And actually, there's an exam you take before that, you get to that stage, and that's going to have a lot of math on it, okay? And I would think doing the stuff for the math team is going to be the best practice you can get for that exam that you've got coming up in your future, because then you don't have a lot, I mean, I'm sure it's probably time and stuff, so to, to find the easiest, quickest, simplest ways, most direct way to work a problem, that's going to be a premium. So if any of your pre-engineers really seriously consider participating in the math team, just for the experience of it, and get a few skills down that will help you out later. So contact me or contact Mr. Racy uh, and let us know. All right, good deal. Any questions on anything we've done up till now? Okay. Um, all right. We are on page 276, uh, or chapter 4, which is trigonometry. To, yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, oh, two things. Two seven, we were here on um, Wednesday, and Right. How exactly do you find the x and y values? I didn't get one. Okay. Um, well, okay. There's a couple ways to answer that. So far, all we've been dealing with is those really special angles. Zero, pi six, pi fourth, pi thirds, pi halves, and then continue going around the unit circle with those. Okay, I'm going to teach you an angle. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Here, got it. All right, so for those ones, it's pretty easy to get those points. So pick one of those. Which one are you interested in? Pi six. Pi six, okay. Um, 
Okay. So what I typically do mentally, sometimes I actually draw it out, is draw a unit circle. Okay? There's plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. I don't draw circles too well, but... Okay. And here is just... Right. Now, pretty ugly circle, isn't it? All right. Pi sixth... Okay, remember this is zero, that's pi halves. So pi six is a third of the way up there, right? And that is, again, not a great picture, okay? And then pretend a dotted line here and pretend a dotted line here, okay? There's your x and the y, okay? That looks pretty close to, for the y, what does it look close to? Is that pretty close to one half? Yeah. Pretty much. If this is unit circle, one, one, minus one, minus one. Okay. That's really close to one half there, isn't it? Okay. Now, then figuring out this is, do your thing that x squared plus y squared is equal to one, right? Unit circle. That would give this square root of three over two. Okay. Now, that's one way, okay? The other way I told you about that you might find quick and useful if you, okay, so this is pi 6. This one right here is going to be pi force. This one right here is going to be, I didn't quite draw it right, uh, pi thirds, I just don't have enough room to write it, so this will be pi thirds, okay, and then of course that is pi halves, and remember my little thing in this of course is zero here, and pi halves here, uh, the y values for those, those are the ones we deal with, zero, pi six, pi fourths, pi thirds, and pi halves, okay, the y values are the square root of 0 over 2, square root of 1 over 2, the square root of 2 over 2, the square root of 3 over 2, and the square root of 4 over 2, which is 1. Okay? Those are the y values, and the x values would be 1, okay, because this is 0. The y value is 0 there. That was square root of 3 over 2. The x value here, I'm going to write it over here, square root of 2 over 2. Okay, and this one would be one half, and this will be zero. That means the x value is zero. Put it in the wrong place. Okay. Oops. Okay. There's your ordered pair up there. And all right, let me get. All right. So what my drawing is so ugly. Let me go back and summarize these. Okay. So they're e more easily read. Okay. I hope they'll be more easily read. Okay. Goodness gracious. Ah! I knew I was going to do that. I feared I was going to do that. Okay. Not quite online, but... Again, those points are... 0, 1. Um, the square root of 3 over 2, 1 half. The square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, uh, 1 half, square root of 3 over 2, 
and one zero. Uh, zero one. Goodness gracious. Zero one. Okay. No. I got this one backwards. Y'all let me do that. Okay. This one's zero, one zero. Okay. And the one up there is zero one. Make it so it's readable. Okay. All right. Now, again, if you look at the y values, the square root of 0 over 2, square root of 1 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 3 over 2, square root of 4 over 2. So the x values go the other way. Square root of 0 over 2, square root of 1 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 3 over 2, square root of 4 over 2. So if you just get that down, and then after that, they follow suit all the way around the inner circle. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. Okay, so that's for these. Now, any old angle in between, you almost have to use the trig functions in reverse. So we're not there yet. But for these, it's pretty easy to get those. And then when you go to the different quadrants, you know, they have the same value, but the signs change or don't change according to the quadrant you're in for x and y. Does that answer it? Okay. Any other questions? Great question, by the way. Okay. Now. We were on example two. That's this one. Um, and they really give you way too much information here. Uh, what they're wanting to do here is find out what the sine of 13, <coughs> 6 pi is. Okay? And they give you way too much information. You want to know what the sine of 13, 6 pi is? That, that's what you're looking for right there. Sine of 13, 6 pi. Well, how would you approach that? Okay, there's a couple of ways. One way is subtracting 2 pi from it, because that's obviously a big number. So you subtract 2 pi from it. Well, 2 pi would be 12 6 pi, right? 2 pi is 12 6 pi, right? Okay. Subtract 12 6 pi from 13 6 pi, you have pi 6. So that's going to be the sine of pi 6, which we just basically did already. Okay. Another way you could do it, I find this just a little bit easier. I don't know if you think of it this way. What is multiplication? I mean, this is a real simple question. Right? And you think you're coming out of the blue somewhere. Isn't multiplication adding the same number over and over and over and over and over again? Like 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 4 times 7, right? Well, guess what? Repeated subtraction of the same number is division. That's exactly what it is. Okay? So rather than subtract and you get fractions and stuff in there, how about less dividing? Six will go into 13 how many times? Two times. Okay? Or two pi times, because the pi is still there. And then when you multiply two pi times six, you get 12 pi. And subtract that from that, and you get 1, 6, 5. There's another way to think of it. It's just do a division, or repeated subtraction with 2 pi. Or divide by, or just do the division there and see what you get. You get 2 pi plus the remainder of pi 6. Well, then throw out the 2 pi, because that's your period, and you get a sine of pi 6. And what is the sine of pi 6? What's your ordered pair at pi 6? Square root of 3 over 2, comma, 1 half. And what's your sign? Z which? Y value. And which of those is your Y value? 1 half. There it is. So that would be, uh, I'm going to 
they wrote too much here. Ah. Okay. Um, yeah. That's uh, the same as sine of pi 6, which every way you do it, and the sine of pi 6 is 1 half, the y value of that. And that's exactly what they did. They said is equal to pi, sine of pi 6, sine of pi 6 is 1 half. Okay? Now, they gave you way too much at the beginning. Let's go to the B part. All right, now don't do all this mess. It says straight here. What is cosine of negative, that's what we're asking for, cosine of negative 7 halves pi? What would you do? Okay. Okay, subtract, uh, okay. This is already negative. Subtract until we'll make it more negative. Add 2 pi. And how many half pi's are 2 pi? 4 halves pi. So add 4 halves pi to negative 7 halves pi, and what do you get? Negative 3 halves pi. Okay, you know where that is? Right, you saw it here? Good. All right, there's 1 half pi, 2 halves pi, or pi, 3 halves pi. You know where you are. Okay, what's your point? Oh, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry, negative. Okay, I'm really trying. Okay, negative one half pi, negative two half pi, negative three half pi, that's the same as? Sega? 90 degrees, okay, you're not. You're supposed to be thinking in degrees, aren't you? <laughs> so we're, we're in radians now, but it's pi half. All right? In fact, let's do it one more time. Let's add another two pi to it. So you added four pi to it, you got negative three half pi, Add another four halves pi to it. What do you get? Pi halves. <coughs> so you get there that way too. So pi halves. What is the cosine of pi halves? So the first thing you ask yourself, what's the ordered pair at pi halves? Zero one. Zero, one. And what's the cosine? The what? The zero. Yeah, it's the x value. So you get zero. So this is what they did, which is <laughs> all right. I, I I can't absolutely tell you how they did that except say, hey, behold, this is what it is. The other way that I suggested you might try to do it is dividing two into seven halves pi, negative seven halves pi, and you will get negative three and a half pi, right? Well, negative three and a half pi's, that's just going into another one, that'd be negative four pi, and then you have the plus one half pi. And I think that's how they, they did it. And, but they just sort of pull it out of the air or some body part or something. And uh, what you can do, I think your idea was probably the safest. Add two pi, you're still negative. Add another two pi, there you have a positive. Figure out where it is, what the order pair is, and the cosine of the y value. Right? Does that make sense? There's several ways to get there. But remember, when you divide it, it got negative 3 pi plus a half, or let's see, minus another half pi. 3 pi doesn't do you any good. You need to get multiple choice. So if you did negative 4 pi, then you go pi halves past it, so pi halves. So this would equal cosine of pi halves, and cosine of pi halves is zero. Absolutely right. And that's what they did, cosine of pi halves, cosine of pi halves is zero. Why is it zero? Because the ordered pair of pi halves is zero, one, cosine of the x value. Make sense? Here's the C one. Uh, all right, this is a different kind of problem here. I wish. Okay. Um, C. 
for sine of t equal four fifths. Guess what, folks? That's what one of our favorite functions. That's not one of our t's that we know about. Because none of those came out four fifths. Okay? They were root threes over twos, root two over one half. Nothing wound up there. But we can still deal with that. Okay? Uh, what their question is, if sine of t is four fifths, what is sine of negative t? Negative four fifths what? Sine is an odd function. So you would do the negative function. And they just gave you the whole answer there. Can we get your name, please? Duan. I'm still learning names and faces. And I have a good memory, it's just short, so. Yes. This is on page 276 in, yeah, in that book. It's example two, top of the page there. Okay. And, I mean, that's the whole problem there, and they just wrote it all out for you. They didn't ask you what they were doing. They just wrote out the thing, and you really don't have anything to do. What they should have said, if sine of t is equal to four-fifths, what is sine of negative t? And then you would have answered negative four-fifths because uh, sine is an odd function. If you negate the input, you negate the output. If that is said cosine of t with four-fifths, what was cosine of negative t, what would that answer have been? Four-fifths, because even though you negate the input, an even cosine is an even function, and it's the same sign as the, as the positive, that you'll have the same sign, same answer as you would with the negative because it's an even function. Okay. Now, they have some checkpoints there. I've already told you before. The checkpoints, uh, you can use, if you can't get them, do them as soon as you can. If you can't get the answers or you're not sure of it, go to Audio Video Solutions and LarsonFreeCalculus.com. Free website. I mean, you don't have to have a code or anything else. Just go to it. All right, now, when evaluating a trigonometric function with a calculator, do all of you have calculators? I bet you do. I don't know if they're here today. You see? Tanisha? Taylor, I'm sorry. There you are. All right. Uh, if you don't have your calculator with you, start bringing calculators. Now, some of you can use cell phone, you typically use cell phones. If you're using your cell phone, your basic calculator probably doesn't have sines and cosines on it, but you can go to the extended calculator. I think it does. But you have to know your own cell phone. I, I can't teach you your cell phone. Okay. Barely know my own. Okay. So when evaluating a trigonometric function with a calculator or a cell phone, calculator or a cell phone, you need to set the calculator to your desired mode of measurement. You've got to do that, otherwise you're going to get wrong answers. So you have to set it for a degree or radius. Now some of the calculators will actually tell you which mode you're in. They have a little printed up there. Uh, R-E-D or D-E-G, letting you know what you're in. A lot of them, like the nice ones, don't tell you that anymore. You have to go and actually query and change it if you need to. If you don't know how to do that, get with me. I'll try to help you figure it out. But all calculators are different, and it, it sometimes takes a little bit of head scratching to figure out how to get to that. But it's usually pretty simple. Most calculators do not have keys for cosecant, secant, and cotangent. They have sine, they have cosine, and they have tangent, and that's all. So to evaluate the other functions, cosecant, secant, and cotangent, you use the reciprocal key because the cosecant is reciprocal of what? Sine. Secant is reciprocal of cosine, and cotangent is reciprocal of tangent. So you can get to it by doing the one you know and then hitting the inverse key. Now, in some of the older calculators, this will be a 1 over x key. Some of the newer calculators will be x to the minus 1 key. 
and there may be other representations for that. That's the reciprocal function of sine, cosine, and tangent. So let's do a few with those. All right. Oh, here's an example. What if you're looking for the cosecant of pi h? Okay? Can you find a cosecant function on your calculator? No. Okay? So what do we do? Negative. Uh, okay, it's not negative. It's, oh, oh, the x is minus 1. Yeah. Okay. And there's two ways to do this. You can either do, because cosecant is a reciprocal of sine, first do sine of pi h, and then hit your reciprocal cube, x to the minus 1 or 1. Or, and it's just about as easy to me to do it this way, 1 <coughs> over sine of pi h, and then hit equal. That will get it to you just about as easy. This keystroke sequence will do it as well. <coughs> Because you know that's what you're looking for. You start with, and in this case, you have to open the parentheses. That's why I like to do it one divided by this. You don't have to worry about remembering to open that first parenthesis. Sign, and when you press the sign key, most of the time you, they give you the open parenthesis. But you have to put this one in first. Sign, usually that gives it to you. Then do pi divided by eight. You close this parenthesis and then this parenthesis, then press your x to the minus 1 key. Why do you have to go through that? If you left this parenthesis off, it's going to give you the reciprocal of pi h, which would be 8 over pi. That's not what you want to do. If you leave off both the parentheses and just do sine pi divided by 8 and then hit this key, that's going to reciprocate the 8. <laughs> and that's not what you want to happen, okay? So you have to be careful when you do this that you get your reciprocating exactly what you want. Whatever's inside this parenthesis, that's what you want. That's why you have to get the parenthesis there. And that's why, to me, okay, it's far better, I mean, I was in the Navy, and we used to have a, a saying in the Navy, you try to make things sailor-proof, but not even a sailor can screw it up, you know. To make it so simple that you can do that. And to me, this is the simplest way. 1 divided by sine, the open that parentheses, pi divided by 8. And then whether you close the parentheses or you not, if you hit the equal key or the inner key, you'll get the right answer. Okay? So that way, you remove this potential error. You know, forgetting to do that, or leaving that one off, or leaving both of them off, you, you eliminate those errors if you do it the other way. Now, but of course, what mode did you better be in if you're doing cosecant of pi x? Radian mode, because if you do not see the degree sign, you're in radian mode, okay? So make sure you're in that first before you do any of this other stuff, then you do your, your keystroke. Now let me give you another hint here. They haven't said it in the book yet, but they will. I want you to think about sines and cosines. We talked about it earlier. What's the range of sine and cosine? You can take the sine or the cosine of any function in the world. What is your answer going to be between what and what? Think of the unit circle. Going around and around the unit circle, what do your x and y always stay between? Plus or minus 1. Exactly. So your sign, and remember your your sign is your y values, that stays between plus or minus one. Your cosine is the x value, that stays between plus or minus one. So for sine and cosine, your your output, your your range is between minus one and one. Right? Now, if you divide by a number between minus one and one, of course you can't divide by zero. If you divide by 1, you get the same number. If you divide by negative 1, you get the opposite of the number. Okay? Right? But for everything else, you're dividing by something that's less than 1. Right? And if you divide 1 by something less than 1, that gives you something greater than 1. So guess what? Secants and cosecants are always numbers from positive 1 up 
or negative 1 down. They're never between plus or minus 1. They can't be because they're 1 over a, fra a small fraction. So that makes them big fractions. So your answer for a secant or a cosecant, if you get a 2.6, sounds like a good number. may not be the right number, but at least it's in the right ballpark. If you got a 0.6, it can't be that. It can't be a negative 0.6. It could be a negative 2.6, okay? Those are all legitimate answers. Now, if you had just done the sign of pi h, and you wound up with a 2.6, wrong answer, because signs are always between minus 1 and plus 1. That's outside that range. So it's helpful to think of the ranges here. Another issue, tangents, and therefore cotangents. They could be any real numbers in the world. So you don't get any help on those. Those answers would be anything from negative infinity to positive infinity. Both sides and cosine. Sides and cosine are always going to be between plus or minus 1, and secrets and cosecrets are always going to be outside of plus or minus, plus or minus 1. Something less than minus 1 or greater than plus 1. Or equal to those. They can be equal, but never anything less. Okay? So that's just another thing to keep in mind. Now, another thing, while we're doing other things. Sine of pi h, okay, where are you, Waldo? Which one? Is? First one. And sine of sine is what sine, uh, SIG is sine in the first quadrant. Positive. Everything's positive in the first quadrant. So if you put in a sign of something and you know it's in the first quadrant, or a tangent or cotangent, anything and you know it's in the first quadrant, and you get a negative answer, I would go back and make sure you're in the right mode. Because more than likely, you, you're in something wrong here, okay? And if you're in degree mode, and that's a fairly big number, you could be in some other quadrant, okay? So, know what you're looking for. If sine is positive, then cosecant's got to be positive too. So if it came out negative, and you know the angles in the first quadrant, wrong answer. Go back and check the notes. So there's lots of little things you can do to overcome these uh, removable errors. <laughs> I mean, things that you could avoid. All right. Any questions on that? All right. Let's do the second one. Sorry, that took way more time. Um, oh, I'm sorry, example 3, A. Sign of 2 thirds pi. Okay, first, what mode did you better be in? Radian, because there is no degree symbol there. And frankly, most of the time you have a pi in there, you're probably going to be a radian mode. Where are you with 2 thirds pi? Where in the world are you? Second quadrant. What's the sign in the second quadrant? Again? Okay, the, the coordinates will be negative positive, and so and which is the sign? Say again, sine is the y value. So negative five, it's going to be positive. Sine is what? No, we haven't done this yet, but let me go and say it now. Okay. Here's the little thing to remember on the calculator, I mean the computer thing. Okay, as you're going counterclockwise around the unit circle. All students take calculus. All trig functions are positive in the first quadrant. Only the sign and its reciprocal, cosecant, are positive in the second quadrant. All students take tangent is positive and its reciprocal, which is cotangent here, and over here, calculus, cosine. Cosine is reciprocal, which is, which is, that is secret. So, that's another thing to have to remember. So, since you're in the second quadrant, sine is positive in the second quadrant. You're in radian mode. So, using your calculator, you just plug it in. Sine of, okay, usually when you press the sine key, the, that parenthesis comes up. Then you do 2 times the pi key. Find your pi key, most calculators have them. Divided by 3, close that parenthesis, then press enter. You got it. 
What kind of answer do you expect to have? Tell me some features of that. You already told me one thing. The SIG inside of it. Positive. Right? And positive 17. Would that be reasonable? No, the signs are always between minus plus or minus one. Can't be 17. How about 1.7? No, it's outside the range. Okay, so you expect to have a small number, okay, and this is what you get. Now, that's an approximate answer. That's your display. Because most of the time your displays don't have radicals in them. Okay, but I know what sine of two-thirds pi is, that's one of our favorite angles. Remember, one-third pi, two-thirds pi. Two-thirds pi, your sine is your y value, and your y left value here is third of three over two. Remember that one of them. You're going up here, and then you go down here. So negative, or third of three over two. And, if you do that, push that in your calculator, third of three over two, what you get. Okay. So you, you knew that answer before you even saw the problem. All right. How about this? Cotangent of 1.5. First thing you ask yourself, what rate, what mode? Second? Radian. Radian, you do not see a degree symbol, okay? Just because it doesn't have a pi in it doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, uh, a degree. That's a radian too. So be sure you're in the radian mode. Now, where do you find your cotangent cube? You don't. What do you use? Yeah, second. Reciprocal of what? Not cosine. Reciprocal of cosine is cube. Yeah, tan. Cotangent is reciprocal of tangent. So you can either do, and again, if you do it this way with reciprocal T, remember to open the parentheses. Tangent, now it usually opens that for you. If you're in radian mode, 1.5, close this one, then close that one, then press the reciprocal T and enter. Okay? Or, frankly, I found it easier, fewer keystrokes, just to do 1 over. Tangent 1.5 and press enter there. You don't have all those parentheses to the number. And what you get, has anyone done it? You get that answer. Second? Yeah. Okay. Now, I forgot to ask you this. What answer would you be expecting to have? Where is uh, 1.5 radius? Okay, okay. 1.5 degrees would be the first part of it. Remember what is oh, uh, You may be right. Uh, how many radians is it to here? Pi hat, right? And pi is real close to 3, right? 3.14. So that's real close to 3 half. And pi is a little bit more, so three halves, which is one and a half, yeah, you're just barely in the first quadrant, but you are. So you expect a positive answer, you got a positive answer. And it's awfully close to zero, okay? Um, and we haven't done this yet, but cotangent is very close to zero at pi half. So that, that makes sense. Later you'll, you'll have a better feel for it. Yeah, that makes sense from every level. All right. Any questions? All right. That was the last <clears throat> slide and the last example. You do have a checkpoint there. I would definitely t go home and do those as soon as I can. Not maybe home. While you're on campus, do those as soon as you can. Check uh, your answers on BarsonFreeCalculus.com. So let's do the vocabulary, top of page 277. Each real number, number one, each real number t corresponds to some point 
x, y on the blank blank? Where are those points on the x, y? Unit circle. And absolutely. A little visual aid helps, all right? Okay. Number two. A function f is blank when there exists a positive real number c such that f of t plus c is equal to f of t for all t's in the domain of f. What do we call that function, that type of function? There is some positive number c, but every time you add f of t plus c, you're going to get the same values you had f of t. No matter what value t you put in. In other words, if your function is here at some point and then it comes back here, and then back to there, back to there, what do we call that? Periodic, exactly. It's a periodic function. Uh, function f is periodic when there exists some c. The smallest number c for which that function uh, f is periodic is called the, the what? Now, this, the smallest value of c for which it is periodic is called the little dot period. Okay, it's called the period. It's almost a redundant question. Um, and number four, a function f is blank when f of minus t is equal to minus f of t. Odd and blank when f of minus t is equal to f of t. Even. Very good. Okay, homework exercises here, either 5 or 7, or both, either 9 or 11, or both. I've already assigned these before. Any of the odds, 13 to 21. Any of the odds, 23 to 29. Any of the odds, 31 to 35. <clears throat> and I think this is the, in fact, may, those may have been the new ones. And these, I think, are too. Any of the odds 37 to 41. And any of the odds 43 to 47. And then do 49. Not a bad idea to look at your true-false. Not that you'll see any of those on quizzes or tests. But think through those, especially the odd ones. Uh, what makes it true or makes it false, whatever. Okay. Number 55 and 50, the other odds, the remaining odds, are things you can read through and think about. If you don't want to do any of those exploration, you don't have to. But they are good things to think through and make sure you understand. Okay? Any questions from 4.2? Let's move on to 4.3. have to sit and wait for PowerPoint to go through its thing again. I'd already done it for 4.2 before class, so we didn't have to wait, but now 4.3 is sitting there. Oh, there it goes. Adi da. I do not like Microsoft products, period, with this. It's so slow. Okay. I keep thinking it's going to do something. I feel the computer vibrating like it's trying to do something. Ah, there it comes. Uh, maybe. There's no reason it takes this long. Ever. There it comes. Okay. All right. We're back in, we're still in chapter four, and let's go to four, yeah, we're at 4.3 on current slide. All right, trigonometry again. This time we're using right triangle trig, which is really, to me, where trigonometry comes from, because trigonometry means measure of triangles. 
So right triangles, that makes sense. Okay? We'll evaluate the trigonometric functions of acute angles. What do we mean by acute angles? Acute angle. Say that again? Okay, between 0 and 90. Okay, only we think in terms of radians so far, right? Between 0 and pi halves. In other words, first quadrant angles. Okay? Evaluate. Uh, trigonometric functions of acute angles, and we'll use calculator to evaluate trigonometric functions like we've already done. Number two, second, use the trig fundamental trigonometric identities. We'll start with those. We're going to continue those throughout this chapter and into the next chapter. Okay, and we'll use trigonometric functions to model and solve some real life problems. Okay, so let's look at the six trigonometric functions not from the viewpoint of a unit circle, but from the viewpoint of right angle, right triangles. This section introduces the trigonometric functions uh, from a right triangle perspective. So let's consider any old right triangle there, okay? Now, a right triangle, we're going to do it in the first quadrant type area, has an acute angle here, a right angle there, guess what this angle has to be? Also acute. How do you know that, even without a picture there? What's the sum of the three angles of a triangle? 180, or pi, right? And what is this angle? Or pi halves. So the other two added together have to be pi halves, or 90. And if those added together are going to be 90 or pi halves, then the both of them have to be less than 90 or pi halves. And if they're less than 90 or pi halves, they're acute. Right? All right. So here we have an acute, uh, acute angle labeled theta. That's the favorite name for the rectangle, theta. Like x is the variable. Show them below. Relative to the angle theta, we have three sides of the triangle. Okay. Now, we used to just call these the legs of the right triangle, and that we call the hypotenuse. Well, let's specify which leg we're talking about. Here's the angle theta, so this is the side opposite theta, and this is the side adjacent to theta. Well, certainly the hypotenuse is adjacent to, but the hypotenuse is always the one opposite the right angle. Always. The longest side in the right triangle is the hypotenuse. This will be the adjacent side, that will be the opposite side. Okay? Now, if you think back and put this into a unit circle, in other words, with that hypotenuse equal to 1, you do that, this is your x value, that's your y value, and that's 1. So it's going to be the same type thing we did before. Okay? What do you think the sine of that angle theta would be? What was it in the unit triangle? I mean, the unit circle? The y value. So the y value corresponds to the opposite side. The difference is the hypotenuse doesn't have to be 1. So the sine of an angle is the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse. Okay? That's what they give next. So using the lengths of those three sides, you can form the six trigonometric ratios that define the six trigonometric functions of the acute angle theta. And I like to do sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. They do it sine, cosecant, cosine, secant, tangent, cosecant, cotangent. Uh, you can do it either way. You can mix them up. I don't care what you do. Okay. And here are those values. Like I already told you, the sine is the opposite side of the hypotenuse, making the cosine the adjacent side of the hypotenuse, making the tangent, since the tangent is uh, sine over cosine, the hypotenuse wipes up, that would be opposite over adjacent, which we had before y over x, right? Same deal. Whereas cosine was x over 1, that's adjacent side over the hypotenuse now. 
And then there's the reciprocals, the cotangent is reciprocal of this, the next one over opposite, secret is reciprocal of cosine, or the hypotenuse of adjacent, and the cosecant is reciprocal of the sine, which is the hypotenuse of the opposite. Now, to make this a unit circle, everywhere you see a hypotenuse, put a one. One, one, one. Okay? And everywhere you see opposite, <coughs> y, that'd be y over one, y. X over 1, X. Y over X, 1 over X, 1 over Y, I'm sorry, 1 over, Y over X, 1 over Y, 1 over X, and X over Y. So, same thing that we had before with the unit circle, except everywhere you had a 1, put a pot in the Okay? Now, The, when I was in graduate school in Nebraska, I had a roommate for a while. He was a senior, uh, actually a fifth year senior, uh, finishing, I think he was in, I can't think, uh, got the word, I just can't think of it. Was the people who do insurance and calculate, you know, rates and mortality and that kind of stuff. Actuary, actuarial science, okay? And I don't know why they took trig, but he was taking trig. And he was the first one I've seen to use this, but now I know other people have. And here's what he used. <coughs> S-O-H, sa, C-A-A, ha, T-O-A, toa. So he would say, sakatoa, sakatoa. And that's how he would remember his relationship. Well, frankly, to me, I knew the relationship, but I had to remember which was the sign, which was a ha, you know, which is O and which is A that sound too much alike. So I didn't find that useful, but if you find it useful, use it. S-O-H-C-O-H-T-A-A. Now, the first time I taught the trig here, or first or second time, a uh, gal who sat right back there at that desk, I remember, this was 18 or 19 years ago, okay? First time I taught it, she said this, <laughs> caught me by surprise. Some old hag caught another hag taking oats away. I'd never heard that before in my life, but that's another good way to think of it. Now, I don't like to think of hags, and maybe one or two terms later, when I was teaching it again, another student, she happened to be female again, said some old hen caught another hen taking oats away. I like that better because I used to raise chickens, you know, I like hens, and they could take oats away from each other. So that makes sense to you. So you can use that if you want to to remember what those relationships are. I just remember sine is opposite over hypotenuse. His cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. Cotangent is reciprocal of tangent. Secret is reciprocal of cosine. Cosine and cosecant is reciprocal of sine. Okay? So any way you want to remember those, use them, okay? Get to know them, okay? You'll use them lots and lots. You'll use them in physics. You'll use them everywhere, okay? So let's use them in example one. Use the triangle given here, okay? To find the values of the six trigonometric, trigonometric functions of theta. Now notice this isn't, theta doesn't have to be one of our favorite little angles. It's not but we can still find the values of those functions, of those, uh, those trig, six trig functions. So let's do the first one. What you want to do first? Sine, sine of theta would be what? Opposite over hypotenuse. Okay, oops. Okay, opposite over hypotenuse. Wait a minute, time out. We don't know the hypotenuse. We have to give up and go home, right? No, I thought Terrell was going to be out the door if I said that, okay. Now, we don't know the hypotenuse, or do we? What's true about the hypotenuse of a right triangle? Oh, what? No, 
On a unit circle, it's what? Now, this isn't a unit circle. With that being three and that being four, there's no way that's one. Okay? I can see that. Because this is longer than three, it's longer than four, one and two quarter. So it can't be one. Unless there's just different numbers. Okay. That's what you see, that allows you to a lot more flexibility with right right triangles today. You can have any size that you want to. Unit circle, you're just stuck to one circle. Square. And what about square? square oh yes, what's that called? Pythagorean theorem. Of course we know what that is. So what were you saying? Three squared, four squared. It's what? Okay, the sum of those squares is equal to the hypotenuse squared. You're absolutely right. Well, what's three squared? 9 plus 16 is equal to 25. And what's the square root of 25? 5 squared. You're right. The hypotenuse is 5. Now, when you take a square root, it could have been plus or minus 5. Why did we use minus 5? Yeah, hypotenuses are always positive. It's a link. It's always positive. Never give me a negative hypotenuse, okay? Ever, okay? And frankly, later we'll have the x's and y's could be positive or negative. The hypotenuse is never negative, okay? So we only use the hypotenuse. Okay, so now can you write down what the sign is? 4 over 5, you got it. How about the cosine? Three over five. You got it. What's the tangent? Second. Opposite over, which is four over three. What's the cotangent? Second. Second. No, cotangent. Reciprocal of tangent. 3 over 4. The secant? 5 over 3. You're right. And the cosecant? 5 over 4. There you have it. And that's why I like to do them this way. Okay. Because that to me follows sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, cosecant. I'm sort of doing counterclockwise, right? And I know that all those are reciprocal to B. And I got these because opposite over hypotenuse, so I'm old hen, called another hen, taking those away. So that's 3 over 5, 4 over 3, and then reciprocal. Now notice sines and cosines are always. Okay, in the first quadrant, they're positive. And they're always less than 1. They can't be equal to 1 on the coordinates, yes? Usually less than one. That makes secant and cosecant greater than one. Okay? Outside of plus or minus one. Again, what we're doing for. Tangent and cotangent can be there. Nothing you can look at and say, nope, that can't be right. Okay. All right. That was our doing. Let's see how they did it. <coughs> By the Pythagorean theorem, they came up with it right away. The hypotenuse is the square root of the positive square root of the sum of the squares of the sides. 4 squared plus 3 squared, that would be the square root of 25, which is 5. Once we know that, we can write down the sine is opposite over hypotenuse, which is 4 over 5. The cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, uh, yeah, which is 3 over 5. The tangent is opposite over adjacent, which is 4 over 3, or sine over cosine, either one, 4 over 3. And then they got jump up and they do cosecant. Weird. Hypotenuse over opposite, which is 5 over 4. The secant is hypotenuse over adjacent, 1 over cosine, which is 5 over 3. 
and the cotangent is the reciprocal of the tangent, which is adjacent over opposite, which is three-fourths. Make sense? And by the way, if tangent is less than one, cotangent is greater than one. If tangent is greater than one, cotangent is less than one. Unless they're negative, and then they're, they go the other way. Okay. Got it? All right, in example one, you are given the lengths of two sides of a right triangle, but not the angle theta. Often, you'll be asked to find the trigonometric functions at a given acute angle theta. To do this, construct right triangles with theta as one of the sides. So now they introduce degrees, which we have done, but also relate those to radians, which we have done, and we write all those again. Sine of 30, which is the same as sine of pi 6, is 1 half. Okay? Sine of 45, which is sine of pi 4, is 32 over 2. Sine of 60, which is sine of pi 3rd, is 33 over 2, which is 31 over 2, 32 over 2, 33 over 2. And then cosine of cosine 30 will be cosine pi 6, that's the same value as 33 over 2. <coughs> cosine 45 is the same as cosine of pi 4, and that's 32 over 2. And cosine 60 is the same as cosine of pi 3rd, and that's 1 half. So the cosines, they go down. Alright, tangent of 30 to the tangent of 60 is basically just over that, uh, which is 1 over root 3, which is 33 over 3. The tangent of 45 is the sine of 45 over the sine of 45. So those are the same value, so that's always that's the positive one. And tangent of 60 is the sine of 60 over the sine of 60, 33 over 1. Those are our special angles. Throw in zero and pi halves or 90, and you got them all. Everything you need. And you can go round and round the circle based on this. Any question? Now, there's another thing. Because you know the ratios, if your hypotenuse of this angle happens to be two, you know the opposite side happens to be one. And the adjacent side happens to be 3 over 3 over 2, or any multiple of those. Right? So you can come up with any kind of situation like that. You got this angle, the adjacent side is always half the hypotenuse, always. Or the hypotenuse is twice the adjacent side. Okay? And that goes to down here too, because cosine is 60. Nothing else to note. Sine of 30 is the same as cosine of 60. Sine of 60 is the same as cosine of 30. Sine of 45 is the same as cosine of 45. But what's special about 30 and 60? What do you notice about those two angles? They are. Oh, your hair is nice today. Say again? Okay, they are acute. You're right there. Acute angles, yeah, there you go. But if I'm paying you a, a complementary angle, there you go. I use the same thing to tell you this. These are complementary. These are complementary. They add to 90. These are complementary. They add to 90. Find that. So the, the sign of an angle is the same as the cosine of its complementary angle. In fact, that's where the co comes from, the complement. So the complement of an angle is, the co-function of an angle is the same as the complement, as the sine, as the function is of the complementary angle. Okay. And that actually also works for tangent and cotangent as well. Uh, 
we can think about this. The tangent of 30 is the same as the cotangent of 60. And the cotangent of 60 is the same as the cotangent of 30. And the tangent of 45 is the same as the cotangent of 45. All right, so what we already said in the box, note that the sine of 30 degrees is one half, which is also the cosine of 60. That occurs because 30 and 60 are complementary angles, only this is an E, not an I, so it's not telling you that you have my hair that actually completing the angle. In general, it can be shown from the right triangle definition that co-functions of complementary angles are equal. The sine and cosine of complementary angles are equal. Tangent and cotangent of complementary angles are equal. The secret, cosecant of complementary angles are equal. Okay? Um, that is, if theta is an acute angle, then it follows that the sine of 90 minus theta, or its complementary angle, is the same as the cosine of that angle. Or, the cosine of 90 minus theta is the same as the sine. Of that angle of theta. Tangent of 90 minus theta is the same as cotangent of that angle of theta. Cotangent of 90 minus theta is tangent of that angle. Secret of that 90 minus theta of the complement of an angle is the cosecant of that angle. The secret of the complement of an angle is the secret of that angle. Now, maybe it's just me. I would have written this in front of that on that side, but they're both the same. They're just Seems like to me to be sort of the sign of the cosine of the, the, the complement. But they're the same. All right. Any questions on that? Now let's see. Whoops. Sorry about that. We skipped. We skipped example two and three. I didn't mean to. Sorry about that. Okay, let's see if we can get these two done. Find the values of the sine of 45 degrees. How would you do that? I, that's probably not a 45-45 triangle, but it's supposed to be. Let's just say this is 45 degrees, and this is your 90 degrees. What would this angle have to be? 45 degrees. Okay? Now, if the angles are equal, that means these sides are equal. So let's say that's 1 and 1. Okay? What would this side have to be? It has a special name. Say again? Square root of 2. Because 1 squared plus 1 squared is 1 plus 1 is 2. High level math today. Take the square root of that, you get square root of 2. Okay? So now can you tell me what the sine of 45 degrees is? Yeah, it's 1 over root 2, which if you rationalize the denominator is root 2 over 2. What's the cosine? of 45 degrees. Say again? Same thing. Square root of 2 over 2. What's the tangent of 45 degrees? 1. Exactly. It's 1 over 1, which is 1. Opposite over adjacent. Okay. Then the checkpoint has you finding the value of secret 45 degrees. What would that be, by the way? Secret 45? Square root of 2. Yeah, so secret 45. By the way, square root of 2 is 1.414, blah, 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 blah. It's greater than 1. Secrets have to be greater than 1. Tangent, sine, and cosine have to be less than 1. They are. Okay. That was example 2. Let's do example 3.
use the equilateral triangles shown. I'll try to draw it. That side's two, this side's two, that side's two, 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 and two. But we're going to take this equilateral, oh, by the way, equilateral triangle, what is also true? Equal angular. And if the three angles are equal, what must they be? Three angles of any triangle add to 180. And if they're all equal, 60, 60, 60. 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 60 degrees. Okay, but I'm going to drop a diagonal here, which exactly bisects the bottom side, which makes this side one and one. Makes this angle, bisects the angle too, 30 and 30. Okay, now with that in mind, it says use that triangle to find the values of sine of 60. And by the way, when you bisect that, that means you get a right angle either place, there or there. So can you tell me the sine of 60? There's a 60. Its sine would be whatever that length is over 2, right? What is that length? Second, square root of 3 because of Pythagorean theorem. Because 1 squared, this is 4, 2 squared is 4, 1 squared is 1, 4 minus 1 is 3, square root of 3 is that side. So what would be the sine of 60? Square root of 3 over 2. The cosine of 60. One half, you're absolutely right. Adjacent over hypotenuse. The sine of 30. What would that be? Here's a 30 degree angle there. It's what? One half also. Opposite over hypotenuse. And the cosine of 30? Square root of 3 over 2. Because it's the adjacent side over 2. Perfect. There is a checkpoint there, tangent of 60 and 30. I think you can do that. We already did the block there. We will pick up next time with example four. All right. Remember, next time will be a week from today, next Thursday. For those who came in late, I have a doctor's appointment on Tuesday at, nine, at 10 o'clock. I have to be there for labs at 9 o'clock. I won't be back on campus till probably after 11 o'clock. So we don't have class, but we're going to make it up next Friday, one week from tomorrow, 9.30 in the morning. Same room, same place. Be there a lot of time. Can't be there. I will record it on YouTube. So see you next Thursday. Yeah. Okay, I understand. I knew that everybody could. Not biology. Yeah. Yeah. Is that anatomy and physiology? No, biology. Yeah. They thought on which biology 104. 104, okay. Can you tell me when you said no class next Tuesday? Tuesday. But we have class Thursday and Friday at that group. In this room. If you can't be here on Friday, I'll report it. Just like I do all of them.